In order to consider the viewing of this video as structured CPD, you must complete the reflective statement to demonstrate what you've learned and its relevance to you. Hello and welcome to Masterclass with me, Mark Colgate. In this program, we're looking at the outlook for fixed income markets. To discuss that, I'm joined by three experts. They are Rod Davidson, who's head of fixed income at Alliance Trust Investments, John Morby, fund manager at GLG Partners, and Curtis Evans, Investment Director, Fixed Income at Fidelity. Rod Davidson, first of all, what's driving fixed income markets at the moment? Is it fundamentals or sentiment? Um, I suppose we would probably say it's a bit of both at the moment. Uh, everyone that manages bond funds are constantly looking at the fundamentals and that picture is slightly changing all the time. Uh, we look short-term and long-term themes for the drivers, but you also can't ignore sentiment. And I think uh, one area where sentiment's been very strong has been the high-yield arena, where high-yield bonds have been rallying now for three or four years, um, showing that sentiment there is very strong. That's the bit of the risk-on trade that's kind of the most aggressive in the bond world, but perhaps that is one area that when you flip to the fundamental side, it should be almost done. So you're a little bit sceptical about the outlook. Oh, yes. I am. OK. Uh, John Morby, how about yourself? What's, what's driving markets? Yeah, I think you know, increasingly over the last um, 18 to 24 months, uh, the GLG Strategic Bond Fund has been um, increasingly focused on delivering a value-driven investment um, approach to fixed income markets. I think as we continue to um, operate in a world that's driven by QE, central bank intervention, political rhetoric, actually sentiment becomes increasingly important. So. Um, you know, uh, certainly, certainly on the on the strategic bond fund, we're, we're increasingly focused on the on the sentiment side of the uh, of the equation. And I think, if you look at the fundamental um, situation at the moment, whilst we live in a world of repressed default rates, um, you know, valuations are getting increasingly um, onerously skewed against the fixed income investor, and particularly on the high yield side, where you're seeing covenants get lighter and valuations get tighter. Um, it, it's becoming, um, I think, an issue for fixed income investors. So you always describe it, your, your job is to be a sort of psychiatrist and second guess <laughs> your peers rather than worry about all the numbers. Yeah, I think that's certainly true where, it, where, where we look at the central banks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's move swif swiftly on. Um, Curtis Evans, what, for you, what are the key things that are moving markets? And I, if I could as well, just bring you in your, just on, on Rod's comments as well on, on high yield. Yeah, on, well, I guess the, the question I'm asked a lot is about uh, yields and why they're so low. Uh, we think there's a good fundamental reason <coughs> behind that. Ultimately, economies uh, experience very, very slow growth, uh, very low inflation. Inflation's recently been falling quite a lot and making a lot of headlines. Uh, so that's really been anchoring bond yields and keeping them very suppressed. So I think there has been this, this overarching fundamental support for fixed income markets, which we can't see going away anytime soon. Uh, on, on more the technical side, I think that's been particularly uh, a topic for credit markets uh, and, and Rod talked about high yield. Uh, we continue to see enormous appetite for high yield bonds and we've seen spreads compress a lot. But the good news in high yield is defaults are, are very low and we would be expecting them to stay low for the next 12 months uh, to 24 months. Uh, we actually think there's, there's still some performance to, to come in, in say the high yield area and it's, it, that is very much a technically driven market. So on a 12-month view, are you a, a buyer or a holder or rather than a seller of, of, of high yield? I, th I think we'd characterise it as a holder. Uh, I think you know valuations are starting to get a bit more stretched, but I think there is a very strong technical overhang, this endless search for yield. Investors are constantly being forced away from cash, incrementally out to investment-grade corporate bonds and then to say high yield. We can see this trend playing out for at least another 12 months. John, how about yourself? You, um, wh where are you when it comes to high yield? And I, I accept that there's lots of different credits, so it's, it's probably quite a. I think question. there are still value in pockets within the high yield uh, within the high yield market. Um, you know, particularly I think some European assets still look attractive. I think the U.S. certainly where we're continuing to skew the portfolio away from from the U.S. Um, as I said, you know, kind of covenants are getting lighter, valuations are getting more stretched um, there. So I think it's very much a a geography-driven trade now, and you know, it, again, driven by central bank intervention and QE, as people get pushed further down the um, the rating spectrum, um, you know, you have to focus on where the value really is within high yield. And at the moment, you know, I think core Europe, 
there are still pockets of value, North America less so. And Rod, uh, bring you back in on it. Are you s seeing pockets of value somewhere or are you just trying to get the heck out of um, that? Within the high yield sector, really, this is about understanding <coughs> uh, risk reward. And we just feel the risk reward picture for investors has moved away from the high yield side. So basically, you can get the similar level of return in investment grade this year than you can from high yield. But the potential annualized volatility from high yield sometimes can be three or four times the volatility that you get in the investment grade side. So I think it's just getting that message out to investors that really it's, there's no incremental return left there. You're at an all-time average high price in the high yield sector. You're at an all-time average low yield. Spreads are close to their all-time lows. Uh, the annualized volatility is close to the all-time lows. So all these kind of technical measures of the market to us just say, look, we're not saying it's going to collapse tomorrow. Um, we maybe think the default rate is a trailing indicator. It doesn't actually predict anything about the future. But it's just a signal. We, we just think this place is overvalued. And therefore, as an investor, you want to be the first one out, or certainly in the first group out, you don't want to be the last ones because this is a highly illiquid market. Uh, I've been involved since the beginning in Europe in the, in the late 90s. And that early period of 2000 was horrendous, albeit it was a very skewed <coughs> market during that period. But uh, it's much more diversified now. I just think there are issues there that some investors may not be fully aware of. Okay. Well, if that's, uh, so don't, don't want to judge it all, you know, it's the sweeping statement, but I mean, if that's an area you're all three have a degree of skepticism about, it's about an issue of timing. Where, John, will be, are you seeing most value at the moment? Um, I think within high yield, um, just or just generally, generally I think I think well. financials still still offer a fair degree of value. I think because of the deleveraging profile of the sector, uh, the continuing regulatory intervention, regulatory oversight, asset quality reviews, um, and stress tests, uh, you know, you you continue to see value um, being derived within financials. Particularly, I think you know some of the new style AT ones offer offer some value. Um, so what, 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 AT1s, that's what's... Yes, yeah, so, so it's, it's a new form of tier one capital. It's designed to basically give a buffer to banks um, in, in the event of stress. Um, and we, you know, we particularly think that you know, certain, certain banks and certain structures offer value. We're a little bit more skeptical about the structures that are right down, no write up and no equity conversion. So um, you know, that, that area I think still offers some value. Again, it's very issuer specific, very issue specific. Um, I think outside that, insurance continues to offer some value. So particularly in the UK, uh, we've been involved um, in uh, quite a few of the UK domiciled issues over the last 12 months. Um, and you know, so in insurance and uh, towards the, the, the more subordinated area of uh, banks, certain area we see value at the moment. But you must, I mean, I was looking at your fact sheet recently, and your strategic funds got something like 43% mm -hmm. of the fund in financials. Yeah, yeah. and that's a, that's a mixture of, um, of some of the more subordinated banks, senior banks, um, the, some of the tier two structures, and particularly, as I say, insurance, um, and focused in the UK. So I think, you know, over the last 12 months, what we've, what we've sought to do is skew the fund away from the, um, the, the, the more aggressively priced issues, particularly in high yield, and rotated some of that high yield exposure, as I said earlier, particularly from the US into European financials where, where we continue to see value. Uh, could, uh, Fidel, are you, are you as big a fan of financials? And I, I think we'd be a little bit more measured. Uh, so in our strategic bond fund, we've got around 20% in financials. We're mindful that we don't want to get too concentrated in an individual sector. Uh, the outlook for financials is, is mixed. I, I certainly, you know, banks are deleveraging uh, on a name by name basis. They're looking safer, but importantly, when you aggregate the financial system, the systemic risk is, is reducing. So that makes us quite constructive. Uh, but on the other <coughs> side, uh, you know, the instruments themselves are becoming more risky. Uh, so even things like senior bank debt is now subject to bail in. Uh, so in other words, if a bank debt did get into trouble, uh, you, you'd see losses on your, on your senior bonds, whereas in the past you had uh, much more safety in that area. 
So for managing uh, our financials exposure, we've been doing it in a, in a bit of a barbelled way, uh, focusing on the highest quality areas. So covered bonds is, is quite a, a feature within our strategic bond fund. And then going into some of these ATL ones as well, but it's very much case by case, line by line. Uh, only where we've got the strongest conviction will we, will we go into those. You mentioned stress tests. I think the, the, the European banking sector has got stress tests later on this year in September. Um, how strict are they going to be, or will there be political reasons why everybody's going to pass the health check? Um, no, we, we expect some of the smaller uh, banks not to pass, and some of the more challenged areas like Spain and Italy to be an issue. But going to John's point, we, we have a similar view, and in fact, our monthly income bond fund that was launched four years ago has been a big buyer of financials since that launch. We, we've run with about a 47% weight in the portfolio since then. So we, we absolutely buy into the value element of the market as opposed to where the trend or the fashion has been going with mm -hmm. hot money. Uh, and I think it doesn't mean that you completely uh, live without volatility because there is volatility during during these periods but <coughs> actually the work by the regulators the boards of the banks the the new chief execs and the demand from their customers is all about uh, improved balance sheets and we think that's a good position from bondholders perspectives then when you look further down the the credit curve in the, the financial sector is about your credit work and if you've got good credit analysts and their interaction with the managers then you can run good positions. It's all about risk reward and uh, we think the reward is still in your favour in this sector, albeit maybe some of the instruments that we might not touch are, are potentially more volatile going forward. And John, given you've got a fund that's it's less than, but say roughly half the funds in financials, half it, what do you do with the other half of the fund so that if something were to go wrong in your financials position, you're you sort of spread your risks, your risk yeah, as I, possible. I, th I think you know we're very focused on being geographically diversified and making sure that we are um, focused on the best risk-adjusted area of fixed income across the globe. Um, particularly, the structure of GLG and the uh, and the way we manage the strategic bond fund allows us to do that. Um, and I think that you know, in terms of cash balances, we view cash as an asset class. We're more than happy. You know, the strategic bond fund is an alpha um, biased fund, so you know we don't. As I say, we view cash as an asset class, and we're more than willing to to run high cash balances as and when we see value disappear from fixed income generically. Um, and then, kind of, you know, running a diversified financials portfolio. I think, you know, focusing on fundamentals and idiosyncratic risks and and actual bond issue structure is is important. So, uh, you know, the number of conversations that I'm starting to have at the moment, particularly around the AT1 sector, that I find quite worrying are that these structures will never get triggered, very, very similar to the conversations um, I was having in 2006 about subordinated bank debt that you know, nobody would ever miss their call. Um, you know, you're starting to see elements of overheating, so I think it's very important to remain focused on you know, the stronger issuers and the stronger deal structures um, and making sure that you're geographically diversified um, it, to, to the right degree. We had a question in, and because if I could address this to you, it says, is the temptation to maintain some sort of yield forcing portfolio managers to move gently down the quality ladder? Uh, is compromise on quality a danger, given this low yield environment? Yeah, I, uh, I think it's, it's a challenge facing every bond manager. Um, ultimately, we need to get return for our clients, um, but we're trying to do so in a measured way. So we've been talking a lot about financials um, going into the high yield markets, and I think geographic exposure is particularly important. Uh, so we, we have been adding risk in our bond fund um, since 2009. Uh, but what we've been doing, it, doing is doing it in a measured way, I guess, using a lot of the different asset classes within fixed income, diversifying quite heavily uh, across sectors. So, um, say in our fund, a, a big feature is the triple Bs and non-financials. Um, so they are at the lower end of investment grade, uh, the area. But what within that, the sectors that we focus mostly on have been quite defensive areas. So things like telecommunications, food and tobacco, uh, those sorts of those sorts of names. And um, in terms of in a lower rate environment, Rob, what, what, how do you, as a fund manager, work out what a sustainable yield is to, to, yeah. to give to investors? I, I think, as Curtis has mentioned, everybody runs their funds in a slightly different way, and I think that's the difficult bit for the end investor to really understand. 
uh, it's worth highlighting that both the other guys here run funds that are in the strategic sector. Our monthly income bond fund is a strategic corporate bond and it's focused on delivering a better level of yield because we think we can do that by managing the fund in a different way in the corporate bond sector. So we actually feel you don't need to be stuck in buying the high yield sector to get the extra yield because it's actually available in the investment grade world and actually then you balance your financials against uh, an allocation to AAA, uh, EIB, KFW etc. That f the fund that we run has an average A rating so we use that as our core to keep the fund honest in the way that we see it. The bigger issue on the other side from the credit is managing the rate cycle and that's all about giving yourself the flexibility to manage the duration separate from the credit holdings. Well, I want to come on to rates in a, in a minute, but just before I did, um, I suppose one thing that everyone was asking bond managers about is where we are with the economy. How strong is it? Where's it going to go? Um, Curtis, th th this was a slide that um, we, we were talking about, uh, and you sent through to me a little earlier, but just sort of showing that the advanced economies, uh, th their rate of recovery, if you like, is, has been slowing really over the last 20 years. What, 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 yes. what are the implications of this it's, for, it's for bond investors? It's a very simple visual and, and growth, the recoveries are getting weaker. That, that's what we're seeing and we've seen it with the US. So uh, in the 90s, 4% was the growth handle that you would have expected to see when the economy was recovering. Then in the early noughties, it was 3%. This recovery, GDP growth has been around 2% and even this quarter uh, largely related to weather it looks like it's, it's going to be around a 2% number. So the handles for economic growth have been a lot slower. Behind this, um, economies have been becoming more and more levered. <coughs> so you've been seeing leverage in the developed world increasing and what's particularly important is since the financial crisis in 2008, uh, leverage really hasn't reduced. Uh, the composition of, of debt in developed economies has changed a little bit. So in the US you'll, you'll see household sector debt has, has fallen a bit, but in the other sectors it's risen. Uh, if you add up debt across developed economies, it's stayed high or, or if anything increased. And so we think that that uh, puts economies at a very precarious position. They're very fragile at this point. Well, if the great financial crisis was about investment banks borrowing more and more money to get slightly lower and lower returns, and what you're describing is the equivalent with the entire global economy, why aren't you more concerned? Well, I think it comes back to central banks and uh, the policy backdrop is, is enormously supportive. I think we're all in this together and that cent central banks uh, have kept interest rates low, which is in part fueled uh, the debt build-up and the leverage build-up, uh, but it's also backed them into a corner. Uh, economies are, are now much more sensitive to changes in interest rates, so when they do at some stage look to increase rates, uh, the sensitivity of the economy to changes in rates is going to be much more than it ever was in previous cycles. So, so the risk here is that you turn Japanese. That wouldn't be our base case, but we certainly see some, some com uh, comparisons to that. John, what's your take on, particularly on the interest, uh, particularly on this, this whole issue of the interest yeah. rate sensitivity uh, as a result of I all mean, this gearing? I, I think that chart is, is actually very telling, and, and what it really describes to me is the is the huge kind of transfer from returns on capital uh, to, to returns on capital from returns on labour that we've seen over the last 20 to 25 years. Um, you know, most Western economies, most developed economies, are set up in a um, in a way that relies on consumer-driven growth. It relies on debt finance, consumer-driven growth in particular. And as you start to reach the margins of counter-cyclical monetary policy, so kind of lower rates through, through, through the course of the last 30 years that has really driven the, um, the debt bubble and the, um, you know, kind of the problems that we've seen in latter years, uh, you start to reach marginal effectiveness of, of, of that counter-cyclical monetary policy to the point where you have to launch full-on into QE-style policies that we, that we see today. So I think you're absolutely right in that you, you know, we, um, we have an incredibly supportive backdrop, but what this does mean, and I think it feeds back into the um, investment style and ethos of the strategic bond fund at the moment, that we're very value-driven because markets are more at mar the marginal level here driven by um, central bank intervention and political re rhetoric than they ever have been in the in the course of the last 30 years. Is there still an interest rate cycle? We touched on it once or twice, but uh, g given what you're describing, or is it? I think we live in a very very skewed environment at the moment, where by traditional fixed income fund management has lost a degree of its effectiveness because of the um, 
inability to kind of look at either interest rate or business or economic cycles and actually position portfolios with respect to the underlying fundamentals and the underlying um, interest rate movements and, and business activity. So, you know, I, I think, as I say, at the margin, you start to become much more skewed by political rhetoric, central bank rhetoric, and, and, and central bank intervention than probably we ever have been, which leaves us in a very, very different environment for fixed income. Well, how does that change the way that you're, you and your team are looking at credits? If it's yeah, no, the guys make some very, good, very good points. Actually, the the chart here is uh, coincidentally coincides with virtually the beginning of my uh, working career. So it's interesting that the whole time I've been in working in the bond world, it's been in a rallying environment in general, and I th I think I know you've got some slides maybe later on that you might show that. I think it's interesting today when we look at the UK, maybe in isolation, that uh, five years into a massive expansion of the, the central bank, the government balance sheet, um, we're still at a position where we're talking about potential threats of disinflation, deflation. I, I certainly, you know, had you asked me 20 years ago what I would be thinking, I would have argued quite strongly we wouldn't have a Japanese scenario it would be impossible for such an open economy like the UK to suffer from this kind of disinflationary period given the expansion of the monetary base. But here we are uh, and there are definitely concerns. I think it's, it's very interesting and maybe the guys have some thought that today you were very close to the Japanese uh, making a move on, on their sales tax again, <coughs> which if we remember back to the mid 90s, they did it then and they killed the economy, the Japanese economy, stone dead then. So I think this just re-emphasizes re this very fragile nature of the current recovery the developed world is going through. There are implications in the emerging world as well and we're seeing that kind of uh, risk debate going on there. So the next few years are going to be quite interesting. But you're in the disinflation. We're not in the disinflation but we're mindful of the position we're in. So. I suppose this then goes back to what you now have is a real return in government bond yields from say 10 years, certainly 10 years out. Uh, that's an attractive position. So arguably from a strategic nature, we'd be adding duration if 10 year guilt yields got to three and a quarter, maybe uh, between three and a quarter, three and a half. And where are they today? Just so to we're, to we're still s sub 3%, maybe 275. I've not been in the office this morning, but around the 275 level in 10 years. So, uh, you know, a bit lower than where we started the year. And, and I think, again, kind of brings in this debate about the great rotation. Well, what does that really mean? Actually, Retail investors are thinking there might be better opportunities in equities, so they might be selling down some bond funds. But interestingly, at the same time in the institutional world, pension funds are actually using this opportunity of better returns from equities, equities to de-risk their portfolios. So actually, rotation has different things for different investors. Well, I want to come on to some of the technicals and who the natural buyers are of bonds in this environment. But just on the inflation point, John, do you, is, are you in the camp of worrying that all this QE means inflation down the line or I deflation? I think we're balanced on a knife edge. I think if you believe the central bankers and the politicians, if you believe that we're moving into a higher growth rate environment and that in, in particular economies are normalizing, you know, we've had talk of the Bank of England moving um, base rates in the spring of next year. We've had Janet Yellen and her comments which caused some volatility um, a, a few weeks ago. I think if you believe the, that, that rhetoric, if you believe what politicians are telling you that the ec economics are getting better, then I actually will, would start to worry about inflation because if you start to see the multiplier effects come back with the amount of money that is currently circulating in the system, then my worry is that you see a sudden and dramatic pick up in, uh, up in inflation. Uh, at the moment, I think the jury is still out as to as to what environment we ultimately move into. I am very skeptical in terms of you know the, the chart that we saw before in terms of the, the decreasing um, uh, absolute amounts of, of the economic recovery of, over time. I think um, you kind of probably worry me more than, than a return to kind of an, an inflationary type environment. But given there's this really fundamental great unknown as you, as you look out there, what do you then do in the portfolio? Do you avoid it altogether as a bet? Do you 
sort of have a little bit of a bet on the each way? What, how do you? No, in, in terms of inflation, I, th I think in terms of inflation versus deflation, what we try and do is, is as, as I said earlier, make sure the portfolio focuses on delivering a value-driven investment ethos. So we're looking at risk-adjusted returns. We're looking at, at particular investment grade, break-even duration profiles, and also looking at investing in things such as floating rate notes, and as I say, viewing cash as an asset class to keep the portfolio um, dynamically positioned such that whichever way the volatility comes, we can try and take advantage of it in the fund. I guess, how about you? Is it yeah, I I share the views in terms of inflation being a knife edge call really. We, our forecast in the next 12 months would be that inflation is, is very benign, but you have to accept that there is this risk and, and central banks are very trigger happy with, with monetary policy. Uh, so in the portfolio, in our strategic bond fund, we're mindful to actually think about some of these tail risks. Uh, so we've got about 7% in inflation linked bonds across uh, different markets, even, even economies like Australia where real yields are a bit higher. Uh, but you can also use other asset classes in fixed income to help hedge you uh, against inflation. So things like high yield uh, typically should do okay in an inflationary environment because it makes it easier for a company to repay its debt. Um, and so there's, there's a few things that we're sort of doing at the margin to, to hedge effectively against this, this tail risk. And if inflation picks up as a potential tail risk, where does it come from? And one of your, again, this is one of the Fidelity slide deck, it's, it's implying that if it's anywhere, it's going to be U.S. wages. Yeah, we're taking we're taking the lead from the U.S. The U.S. is is really at the front of this this global economic cycle, um, and we are looking at the the labour market in the U.S. Now, un the unemployment rate has certainly been falling, but uh, Janet Yellen has has been quite um, cautious about the improvement in, in the labour market more generally. But wages is something that we are closely looking at. We've seen a pick up. Uh, but interestingly, she just highlighted uh, a couple of days ago that uh, she still feels that the improvement in wages is, isn't anything material yet. Okay. Well, we've had another question, and it ties in well, very neatly with what you were talking about on the technicals. Uh, it says, what do you think of the growth opportunities for fixed income asset managers in the wake of the recent pensions shake-up? Is that creating more natural buyers of fixed income? Or yeah. Uh, actually, we think this is a really interesting area. Um, I, I, as was the last topic, but but from our own perspective, um, I, and then the guys here probably have been in a similar situation too. Bond investors, uh, a lot of them have managed the annuity funds for the life companies, so we're well versed with what's going on in the annuity world because annuities are priced off corporate bonds. So. I think in this period going forward where individuals may have more ownership of their underlying assets in their pension funds, then the alternative products available in the fixed income world can offer a tremendous delivery here. And I actually think this is a fantastic opportunity for fixed income managers with the right products in the right areas. We have a fund that uh, our monthly income bond fund distributes to, to new investors today around a 5.7% on an average A-rated portfolio. This is a very attractive alternative given to, to annuities, given our ability with the tools available that we've all been talking about to manage the underlying interest rate and beta components of these strategies. So, yeah, we're, we're quite excited, I must admit. Implicit in what you're saying is now is not a good time to be running a, a gilt portfolio. It, well, you know, the, to have a, a guilt-only portfolio um, is probably an extreme position for investors at the moment because it's a concentration in a single borrower, so we all know the issues of that, and yields are low. I mean, having said that, we, if yields do back up, um, you know, when you do your forward analysis of potential returns, then actually the annualised returns start to look okay when we're 50 to 60 basis points higher for the one year view forward. I, actually, it's a bit more complicated than that because the risks to us are beginning to move ever more to the front end of the market. So strategies where investors are locked into short duration positions, we think they're more at risk because actually that's where, if the interest rate cycle turns, that's where yields are going to move the most. Okay, but just on, on the point of supply and demand, uh, John, do you, do you think there are now going to be fewer natural buyers of government bonds on the back of what's happened? I, I mean, I, our, our view for the last um, for the last few years has been that actually one of the poorer risk-adjusted areas of fixed income to be in was governments, given zero interest rate monetary policy and the rep repression of yield curves. 
most of the uh, risk, particularly in investment grade, um, towards the higher quality end of investment grade in particular was coming from interest rate volatility, for instance, and not from, from the credit spread volatility. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's not changed our view, particularly that, you know, uh, where we stand at the moment in terms of government yields, um, you tend to add little incremental return and, and actually quite a lot of volatility to a fixed income portfolio through skewing the fund to a, to a more government driven um, investment structure. Uh, it's one of the reasons that we've skewed away from, from government bonds um, over, over the last few years. I think on the pensions um, question, you know, I th uh, in the short term, there may be kind of a little bit of an adjustment process, but ultimately, you know, I think um, your point that it, it creates a, a you know, huge opportunity for people to take control of their assets and actually seek out um, the better risk adjusted areas of, of fixed interest. Because I mean, when this announcement came from the government, did, did the gilt market take a hit the same way that the life company share prices did, or was it just a minor? Yeah, the gilt minor market, yeah, the longer end of the gilt, gilt curve is saw about a, t a ten base or eight to ten basis point rise in, in yields, uh, not drastic. Uh, what was interesting was the actual long dated credit market was relatively resilient. Uh, you saw a few basis points of spread widening out there. Um, but I think the, uh, I actually think this is probably more important for sterling credit as opposed to uh, gilts per se because a lot of these, uh, the annuity accounts, they're holding corporate bonds instead of gilts. Um, but the gilt market, or sorry, the UK corporate bond market is, is very tight. Uh, everyone's always in search of paper and particularly longer out. Uh, so while you know there might be a little bit of a, of a reduction in, in some of the buyers out there, I, I still feel that um, you know, the market's pretty strong. There's a lot of yeah. hunger out there yeah. for the paper. Um, one question that I know and gets asked a lot is, if and when interest rates go up, will <coughs> bond returns suffer? And I was again bringing, if I can bring this chart up, because um, you, you were sort of showing here, lay these up the last three times that the interest rates went up. Uh, that's the, that's the, the red line at the bottom there. You can see it going up. Uh, and above that, it's just showing what the total return is from, from various components of the bond market. So uh, the gist of this seems to be rate rises still mean you're going to make money from bonds on a total return basis. Not is, necessarily, but I, I think there is a lot of hysteria in the market that uh, you, you read a lot of headlines that suggest that interest rates can only go, on, go one way and it means that for bond investors it's going to be a very negative return environment. Uh, this chart looks at the US uh, examples, the past three rate hike cycles, and looks at the returns that, that investors faced as a result. Um, 1994 was, was quite extreme. A lot of people talk about that cycle and the Fed lifted rates all the way from 3 to 6% over the course of a year. And you saw the 10-year Treasury yield back up about 250 basis point. Uh, the worst falls that we saw in the, in the US bond market around that time was around minus 6%. So, so not that extreme. But the important difference back in 1994 was that interest rates were a lot higher back back then and you, so the income support you got was, was very favourable. I think 2004 has got more similarities to what we could potentially expect and that's where the Fed took rates all the way from one to five and a quarter but in a very gradual fashion. Uh, these were very well tele telegraphed uh, rate increases and you'll notice the 10 year Treasury yield in the blue was remarkably anchored between four and five percent around that time. So the combination of slow uh, and steady rate rises with an anchored long end of the curve. That meant that the returns for bond investors were actually uh, were positive, and that was because it, it allowed the income to dominate and support returns. John, does that give you hope of the future, given we live in a world where everybody's telling everybody what they're going to do before they do it? Uh, and uh, I think there are two, I think there are two, there are two keys, um, you know, and I think it's correct to say that it's you know, predominantly about income support. So in a world of, of higher yields, obviously you're more, um, sorry, you're less exposed to the volatility and fixed interest via rate rises. Um, but it is also how the central banks telegraph those rate rises. Um, you know, I am a little bit more skeptical in terms of the, the absolute low levels of yields we're coming from at the moment. Uh, I think we will see more volatility than in previous cycles just you know, there is, there's a lot less wriggle room for, for central banks to actually um, raise rates and it, you know, kind of for investors to be insulated from, from the volatility. You know, we talked earlier about the high yield sector and how the yields there are compressing, about, you know, kind of government yields and, and how they're at historic lows, pretty much. 
Um, so I think you know there's th there's more scope for volatility this time if we start to see the rates um, cycle turn. Rob, does that give you hope for the, the future that they, they they'll pull off the trick again? Y yeah. Well, the interesting point from a bond manager's perspective is uh, none of us has the crystal ball, so we don't know. Nobody knows any more than anybody else when the rate cycle is going to turn and the implications for markets. The good thing from uh, from the retail investor's point of view is we've been thinking about this situation for a long time and we have more tools available to allow us to manage the funds through these different periods. And I, and I think that's a very exciting thing with where bond funds are today. I, I absolutely agree on your final points there. I think you need to be very mindful when you look at the correlation of what happened to the change in the rate cycle to the other asset classes because your start point is very different in each of those periods and, and I would go back to high yield as well and say the start point for high yield is very, very different to what it was in 2004. So again, it's we think um, rates will begin to move higher at some stage, probably towards the end of next year. Um, how aggressive they're going to be we're really not sure at the moment, and, and of course it goes back to an earlier point Curtis made about the fragility of the recovery. So each economy will have to operate slightly in isolation and understand what it can really do. The UK, as we know, we, we have this heavy bias towards uh, home ownership, private home ownership, and so do we really know how well the UK economy contained with, with uh, higher mortgage rates? London is a very different place to the rest of the... I might represent the North in some respects <laughs> there, but uh, we certainly haven't had the movement uh, in Edinburgh and property prices that you've seen in London. So I, I would say any move in the mortgage rate in a meaningful way, which I guess is a 1% addition onto the mortgage rate, I think there's real implications of dumbing down potential growth. So yeah. that's what we have to contend with. And so just very briefly, so your camp that rates will start to rise towards the end of next year? That's what we have in our forecast, yeah. Uh, just get a view. But John, what about yourself? When are you...? Yeah, I think probably, you know, we, we've said for the last 12 months the UK probably will be the first central bank to move. Um, I th we still kind of stick to that, and I think you know, the rest of the central banks will follow towards the end of next year. Yeah, ne something. next year as well, but the important point being they're going to be very slow and incremental moves. <laughs> And can I ask, w w when there's all this talk about uh, sort of Janet Yellen takes over and they say, oh, she's communicating, well, she didn't quite say what she thought she, we were going to say. Do, as you as fund managers, do you sit there and, and, and pore over what she's written, what she looks like when she's speaking, or do you just sort of leave it to the markets and come back? Just as we are in this world about said communicating about the fact we're all going to communicate. I think it's inter you, you should really interpret, interpret the, the data yourself, and I think people get a bit lost in the in the communication of central banks and, and almost read too much. Um, so we tend to look at economic data independently and form our own opinion and then sort of overlay that with, with what they're saying. John, are you data or, you know, somebody said that she said dot, dot, dot? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I totally concur with Curtis on that point that, um, you know, you, sh you should do your own analysis and make your own assumptions. I think actually the point of people poring over FOMC statements and particularly Janet Yellen and, and what she does or doesn't say and similar with Ben Bernanke before just it, it, it just goes to show and point out how sensitive markets are to central bank rhetoric and intervention and, the, and why the world we're in at the moment is very different from a lot of the fixed income environments we've, we've lived through over the last 30 years. Well, you know, it's yeah, it's a nightmare noise, because yeah. I, I'm going to concur with everyone else. <laughs> but but I, I, I think I, I almost, uh, you know, being slightly older and slightly more sceptical, I, I think um, we always need to understand that these central bankers are extremely intelligent people, but again, they don't have the crystal ball. So they don't know exactly what's going to happen in the future. So therefore, how they deliver a statement, I mean, the nth degree of analysis there is not going to give you that much of a touch on, on what actually happens. How, having said that, it, some statements can move markets in, in some strange ways, so you do have to take account of that. We've got about five minutes left, and I, I want to pick on something that's been alluded to, but I think pretty much by all of you in the last 40 minutes, uh, and that's uh, what is the right kind of bond fund to have in this world, with, if you like, the retreat from QE? Um, I mean, your Fidelity Strategic Bond Fund was launched 
well, before the um, financial crisis. 2005. Yeah. Um, have you had to make any fundamental tweaks to that? The model, the no, ideal asset allocation I, over, over the last. I think strategic years? bond investing makes a lot of sense at this point in, t in this point in the cycle. Um, when we think about strategic bonds and what that means, what we try and do with our fund is is ensure that it preserves the three key attributes that investors require of fixed income assets, and that is gives you a decent level of income, has low volatility and low volatility relative to places like equities, and then also provides an important diversification benefit, so tends to be more resilient than, say, equities or can even uh, be negative correl uh, negatively correlated at times. Uh, so for us in, in managing this fund, we're trying to ensure that we we adhere to those three pillars. And I think at this point in the cycle where you know rates might start to, to move or the credit markets might come under a bit more pressure, having that flexibility is important. Uh, uh, Rob, would you go along with the strategic bond funds or the Well, I, what I would say is it's all about flexibility. Uh, strategic is just a, a name. Uh, the way we, we break it down in two ways. We have a fund that delivers income for clients. Uh, it's got a strategic component, so within that we think we've got enough flexibility to manage for an upswing in the cycle. The problem is delivering for income, you've got to own cash bonds because that's the accrual basis. So that is different from, say, our dynamic bond strategy, which is a target return of 6%, but an annualised volatility of one7 That's a heavier user of derivatives. So you don't own as many underlying cash bonds, so you don't have the constant beta exposure to the market. And that's how we, we think investors, one for income, one for total return. And what we find is some investors use a 50-50 split of the two. So they take a slightly lower income, but actually their volatility drops on the total portfolio as well. And just picking up on that, but John, why are they called strategic bond funds when perhaps tactical or Opportunistic might be a better. You could. Tactic. I mean, <coughs> there there are a plethora of different funds. Um, you know, kind of strategic, flexible, dynamic. They all you know, kind of. Um, you can call them what you want. It's how you manage the underlying assets really that, that that's important. And I think, you know, it comes back to to the question of, 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 as to what kind of bond fund is important in today's environment and, and what can deliver returns to investors. I think you know we focus on capacity and liquidity the ability of, to be able to move the fund um, to the best risk adjusted area of fixed income. And in particular, I think that you know there are some funds that maybe are labeled strategic that are much more beta orientated. And I think as you grow in size, as the funds get bigger, um, you tend to find that the, 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 the bigger funds generally migrate to being a more beta type structure. And you know we haven't to forget that betas can move quite aggressively in times of stress as well. So. You, know, you, you may think you have a beta of 0.8 in a more normalized environment, but actually in a stressed environment, the beta very quickly moves to 1.2 because of the correlations in, in the underlying asset classes. So I think you need to be um, dynamic uh, in terms of your asset allocation and, and have the discipline to particularly avoid the most overvalued areas of fixed income. Um, and uh, in particular, make sure that you're positioned in the best risk adjusted asset class within the fixed income environment. Now I've had a question, it's always nice to end on a high, but it's bonds, so we're all risk aware. And it's a bit of a, it's a risky risk question. Uh, if I could get your, uh, I'll come to you first on it, because just a final answer on this one. It says, uh, if there's a correction in the market, would you feel constrained by your investment strategy with the funds you manage, or would you f be able to increase the cash weighting significantly? Would I think uh, a strategic bond fund has great flexibility. So if the market comes under pressure, whether it be the credit market or the rates market, we've got a lot of other things that we, we, can, uh, we can do. So cash could use. be a tool, but it's, it's Ca not the Cash is one of the tools. Geographic uh, exposure is, is important, particularly because you can see interest rate cycles varying across regions. John Morgan. Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, we view cash as an asset class on the fund. We have no... Um, we have no uh, uphang about kind of using cash to defensively position the fund. Very different to a beta style fund, a more traditional fixed income fund. And we also have a variety of different derivatives tools that allow us to both take out credit risk and interest rate volatility on the fund. What types of final thought? Yeah, it depends what type of meltdown that the markets are experiencing. We, we don't tend to use cash um, because there's no, there's no income or return there at all. So. Uh, we, but it's all about flexibility, so we feel in the more flexible strategies you always find some area of the market that can offer you even a holding period of return. So <coughs> that's the great thing about bond funds at the moment.
Okay, we have to leave it there. Thank you all. Thank you very much indeed for watching and for your questions. And if you've missed any of this or you'd like to go back over it, it will be available on Asset TV as a replay facility very, very shortly. And do keep watching because there's some news here on how you can use this as part of your structured CPD. It just remains for me to thank our panel. They are Rod Davidson, John Morby, Curtis Evans. Gentlemen, thank you all very much. From all of us here, thank you for watching and goodbye for now. In order to consider the viewing of this video as structured CPD, you must complete the reflective statement to demonstrate what you've learned and its relevance to you. Among the topics covered by this masterclass are what rising rates mean for fixed income markets, what strategies are best placed to deliver in today's market environment, and protecting portfolios from the future effects of inflation. Please now complete the reflective statement to validate your CPD.